do angels have to obey humans? There is some teaching from some very popular charismatic outlets, including Bethel Church in Redding, California, that teach a kind of doctrine that um, angels have to obey humans. And I suspect part of the way that they derive this doctrine is because uh, Jesus says, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. You will trample serpents and scorpions and they shall by no means hurt you, right? And so uh, if you think about the relationship between angels and demons, they all came from the same place. At one point, they were all holy angels that were under the um, under obedience to God, right? And so like you say, okay, well, if we have authority over demons, which whenever I get to demonic spirits, uh, we will certainly examine that question. But um, we have authority over one kind of spirit. Maybe we have authority over other spirits, including holy angels, which did not fall away and um, belong to God. And so do angels have to obey humans? And so... I think that this question ref- reflects on us, like how we think about ourselves. Like it could very well be, you know, again, Bethel doesn't teach us that we don't have a sin nature. And so therefore, if, if, if it is true that we have the ability to command angels, then it's good and right and true, right? But because we do have a sin nature and the Holy Spirit is at war with the flesh, Right? Um, Romans 7 and Galatians chapter 5. Um, because we do have a sin nature, coming up with a theology to say, oh, angels have to obey me. That, it, it could become, just just starting out with the, with the right kind of uh, heart, hopefully, it could become just a quite the self-serving theology. Like, man, that kind of makes me feel good. Like, angels had to bend their knee to me. They had to do what I say. Right? But do they, <laughs> you know, do they have to obey me? Right? So we need to understand the situation that angels find themselves in. That Christ... put on flesh but he was very man and he was very God at the same time right and he he put on flesh because he had to be one of the sons of men in order to be able to pay for our sins he didn't take on himself the nature of angels he didn't put on wings or some such thing, you know, to make him like an angel so that he could save them. And so the, the point is, is that angels are not subject to the salvation that God has offered, which is part of the reason why they're, they're watching all of this stuff with very great interest. This crazy thing that God takes rebels who are shaking their fish and God, I'm going to bring you down a la Satan. Right. And, and, and God says, you know, I could just wipe you off the map, but instead of doing that, I'm, I'm actually going to save you and I'm actually going to make you better than you ever were scheming, plotting and planning in your own wisdom and your own strength. And the angels are just like, what? Like, what are you doing? Like, this is crazy. Then, you know, when people, when people, uh, repent and turn to God, the angels, Jesus, the angels shout for joy. Um, you know, the parable of the lost sheep. Um, so Hebrews chapter two, verses 14 through 17, for as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage for verily he took not on him the nature of angels but he took on him the seed of Abraham, wherefore in all things it behooved him 
to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Okay, And if you, if you look at the literal translation, and so another public domain text as, in addition to the King James Version would be the Young's literal translation, and it would say, Verily he did not give aid to angels, or he didn't give help to angels. And so the, the point is, he didn't take on himself whatever it is means to be an angel so that he could save angels from their sins. He came to save the sons of men from their sins, which is why he took on flesh and blood just like we have, right? And so angels are not subject to salvation. And because angels are not subject to salvation, if they sin, which is possible Adam was right, God made Adam righteous and Adam obviously ended up sinning, you know, look around you in the world that we're in today. It is possible, a la Satan and his angels, right? It is possible for an angel to sin. There's no, there's no like invisible wall that like keeps them from sinning or something like that. And so Im imagine the circumstance where if they, I mean, God's the only judge, right? God is the one who determines who, who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. And so if, if they disobey God, even just a little bit, because God is holy and he de rightly demands perfection, on, uh, ongoing perfection, never-ending perfection. If they sin against God, there, there is no, there's no outlet. There's no repentance. There's no method of salvation. There's no redemption. There's you sin and you have to bear the weight of your sin. And we see actually an example of angels that sinned and God judged them precisely because they're not subject to salvation. And so Jude chapter one, there is only one chapter in Jude, verse six, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So imagine that you are a servant of God, but if you make one mistake, right? Uzzah, Uzzah thought he was steadying the ark and he just reached over. I mean, it seems like to us such a, such a, a simple thing, even like a good intentioned thing. He reaches over to steady the ark and God's jealousy burned against him and Uzzah dropped dead. Right? Like, God is holy and he, he is right in judging anything that provokes or demeans his righteousness. And so, again, consider the situation the angels find themselves in. They have to give an account to God and they belong to God and if they sin against him then he will judge them and so in that scenario where there's a true fear of God are they are they going to say oh I have to obey a human which may frankly be in contradiction to God how how often do we actually really completely and wholeheartedly obey God. And so how often could you imagine that a human is commanding an angel to do such a thing, but isn't actually in the will of God? And then, of course, also consider the, frankly, the perverse incentive of, well, I don't have to deal with God who made it answer my prayer. I'll just command the angel and I'll make the angel do it. I want the angel to do for me. You, you, see, the, you see the motive? You see the perverse incentive? Um, which would, of course, make you ask the question, well, why in the world would God ever issue such a thing if it's, it's almost like a loophole to his righteousness or a loophole to having to do with him and, and submit to him and seek him whenever we can just not bother with him and just go through some angelic loophole or something. Um, ultimately... Um, we will actually judge the angels. And, you know, so you maybe you could argue, oh, well, if we're going to judge the angels, then they want to do what we want. But again, we have a sinful nature. And so we are most certainly going to command the angels to do sinful, Jesus, self-serving, self-seeking, self-worshipping things. 
Um, we do ju- we do judge the angels, but remember remember Jesus is the judge. The Father has committed all judgment unto the Son, so that everyone will honor the Son as they honor the Father in John, right? But the Son only judges how the Father tells him to judge. And so this judgment of us judging the angels is not just this um, self-serving, biased judgment of, hmm, how do I feel today? If I'm feeling good, I might um, declare you innocent. And if I'm, if I'm just feeling just a little bit irritable just because, then I might arbitrarily throw you in jail or some such thing. Like, that's, that's not perfect justice. That's, that's, that's me being biased. Bias is not justice. Bias is just my whim of however I happen to feel, right? And so whenever it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 through 3, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the saints shall be judged, if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you, ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? And so our, our judgment of angels comes in light of us knowing everything that God has revealed to us, us not being tainted by sin anymore, us seeing Jesus face to face, right? Every tear being wiped from our eye, right? And so this judgment is not a self-seeking, self-serving judgment. You know, ooh, angel, if you don't obey me, I'm going to stick it to you. Ooh, 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 I'm going to stick it to you. Like, no, the ju- the judgment, the true justice that happens is because of God's justice and God's righteousness and not because we suppose ourselves to be anything. Um, just consider um, that that angels are greater than humans. And so do we do we recognize in our relationships where somebody's more powerful than us that they for some reason have to obey us? Isn't it exactly the opposite way around, right? Psalm 8, verses 4 through 8. What is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. But again, explicitly excluding angels because he's made lower than angels. Someone lower, do you like? Do you boss your boss around? Hey, boss, um, you're gonna do what I say because I just made that up right now. Like, no, your boss bosses you around, right? That's the way that it works. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, sheep and oxen and beasts of the field and fowls of the air and fish of the sea and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas, right? Man is lower than angels. Second Peter 2, 11, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, I think self-evidently so, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. And so the the point is like what a funny what a funny and an odd thing to suppose that that um, we see a we see a picture of David at the threshing floor which eventually is going to become the temple and the angel has his sword his flaming sword out, and he's getting ready to destroy Jerusalem so one angel can destroy an entire city even God's favorite city Jerusalem but we're going to command the angels that have the power to destroy an entire city to do what we want. What a what a fascinating Jesus! What a fascinating thing to to suppose that they're going to obey us, and and of course the question would be, well, crap! If we can obey, or if we can command these angels that are so much more powerful than us, why aren't we all billionaires? Angel, give me a billion dollars! I command you, right? I mean, how come you know with the the uh, the sort of proliferation of prosperity theology, like shouldn't we all be billionaires by now? Because we command the angels to do thus and such something in order to, to, you know, show a secret treasure or just bring us piles of cash or something. Um, I deal a lot more with this in another video on my other YouTube channel called The Prayer Project. And so I'll put a link in the description to that video, Do Humans Have Authority Over Angels, where I, where I, I talk more and give more examples from scripture. But I'm just going to give one example here. Uh, to end the video, um, Judges chapter 13, verse 8. And so an angel of the Lord visited um, Samson, who was going to be a judge of Israel, visited his mother and then his father, 
and gave instructions, right? An angel is a messenger, and the angel is giving instructions about how the boy is to be raised, Samson. Then and uh, Manoah had not seen the angel at first. It was only the mother. And so she, the mother told Manoah about it. Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O oh, my Lord, let the man of God, which thou did a sin, come again to us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And then the next verse, the Lord hearkened unto the voice of the man. I'm paraphrasing. Um, you know, if, and you know, Samson was a judge of Israel. If humans have authority over angels, you'd think that Manoah would just kind of listen to his wife say, oh, an angel visited me. And he'd kind of start strutting about a little bit. Like, angel, I command you by my power and by my glory and by my majesty to come back to me. And that's not, that's not remotely what you get here. And actually no place in scripture. There's not one place in scripture where a human commands an angel. Lots of places in scripture where angels command humans. And the humans actually are rightly terrified. Jesus um, actually, Manoah's wife says that this man of God was terrible to look at, right? <laughs> and so we, we get lots of pictures in Scripture of, of humans being terrified of angels. Um, the, the heavenly host, whenever they visit the shepherds in the field before they go and, and see the baby Jesus in the manger, the host of heaven is surrounding them and giving glory to God, and they were frightened, <laughs> Because the angels are bigger than them. They're more powerful than them. They were frightened. And so just like such a funny thing. Like can can you just imagine thinking about somebody that you're afraid of. Or you have been afraid of because they're bigger and stronger and intimidating or something. And you just strut up to them and say, you're going to do what I say. I, can, you, can you imagine such a thing? Like it's just, um, it's very, very funny. So what do we see in this verse, Judges chapter 13? Manoah absolutely does not command an angel to do any anything at all. He entreated the Lord. Why? Because the the agents are the angels are agents, right? They're agents of the Lord. They're ambassadors of the Lord. They're servants of the Lord. They're slaves of the Lord. They obey Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, and he tells them where to go, and he tells them what to do. And they they are, are ultimately accountable to him. And so uh, they're going to do what he tells them, right? And so he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said, okay, fine, I'll I'll send him back again, and he did, right? And so I don't think that it's necessarily wrong to desire an angelic account, encounter. I mean, I guess I would ask the question, like, why? Like, if you can meet with God, why would you want to meet with his flunk, want Jesus? Why would you want to meet with one of his flunkies when you can meet with almighty, eternal creator God? Like, why would you... Why would you want lesser? Why would you want to settle for lesser? But let's just say that some reason you do. I'm not saying that an angelic encounter is wrong a priori. Uh, obviously, there are angelic encounters in the Bible. And even this time, Manoah actually prayed for it. But it's God is the one who ordains such things and not humans. So, do angels have to obey humans? Um, no, not remotely, not remotely, remotely. Do humans have to obey angels? And, uh, you would remember Zechariah in Luke chapter one, whenever he says, well, how's this going to happen? You know, I'm old and my wife's old and, and Gabriel strikes him, um, quite the opposite of, of him commanding him. The, of, of Zechariah commanding him, the angel strikes Zechariah so that he can't speak until John the Baptist is is born and they name him John the Baptist, right? And so, um, do angels have to obey humans? No. No, there's not one example in scripture of that. Do humans have to obey angels? <laughs> yeah. And if they don't, woe to them, right? Woe to them. 